Well, what a joy to come back. I remember a number of you from last year, and then a few of you are newer this year. But uh, really great to see you. And yeah, as Graham said, if uh, throughout the week, if you'd like to meet up and chat about how your music and faith in God relate or anything, uh, I'd be so happy to do that. Uh, especially if you buy me coffee in the nice coffee shop. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm uh, titling our talks over these five days, Honest to God, Encountering Truth in the Psalms. Honest to God, Encountering Truth in the Psalms. And let me just explain a little bit of why I feel this is very pertinent to each of you as budding musicians here at the Chehi Summer School of Music. And certainly to me, for me as well, and all of the faculty, and anyone, I think, who really wants to seriously encounter God. The history behind the Psalms and how we approach the Psalms as much more than simply um, devotional literature, as it's most often turned to, the history behind it as serious study is really hearty and quite robust. For example, Athanasius, in as early as the 4th century, that's 300 and so on, referred to the Psalms as an epitome of whole scripture. Basil, the bishop of Caesarea, similarly in the 4th century, about 361, referred to the Psalms as a compendium of all theology. Augustine, St. Augustine in the 4th century, all these chaps from the 4th century, quoting him, the Psalms are the conversation of the heart addressed directly to God. Conversation of the heart. I think it's so pertinent as well because the Psalms are supreme examples, in my opinion, of musical poetry in accord, really, with the height of Hebraic uh, Hebrew tradition. And as such, they give license, as good poetry does, for such honesty with God and with each other, which is absolutely critical for deliberate and serious discipleship and for healthy Christian community that might have any hope for missionary uh, resonance with the world around us, to be in contact with our world in a real, honest way. One of the foremost scholars of the Hebrew Psalter, that is the Hebrew hymn book, the Psalms, John Goldingay, puts it like this. And listen to this carefully, it's so helpful. The book of Psalms is the literary sanctuary. Like the physical sanctuary structures of the Old Testament, it offers a textual holy place, a textual holy place where humans share their joys and struggles with brutal honesty in God's presence. So the Psalms give you such permission just to pour out your heart to God with utter honesty, both the heights of experiences of joy and the depths of sorrow and despair and anger, lament and praise, all from the honest expression of the heart. The collection of the Psalms is divided, some of you might know, into five books. Some scholarship think this is to reflect Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the number symbolically demonstrating that the Psalms, like the Pentateuch, are in fact authoritative scripture. Each one of those five books closing with a doxology of praise to God, except for the fifth book, the last book, which is even more expansive in its doxology, as it concludes with a special group of five psalms in which each one begins and ends with 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to God be praise. Well, for this week together, these, this morning and the succeeding four mornings we have together, I've chosen to limit our kind of perusal study of the Psalms to Psalms written and performed specifically by the sons of Korah. Most of us think of the Psalms as written by David, and of course King David wrote many of them, but there are various other ones, Songs of Asaph, but this week we're going to consider the songs written by the sons of Korah. There are 12 of them, beginning with Psalm 42 slash 43, which beautifully Nancy had us sing the opening of that at breakfast, that wonderful song and comes directly from Psalm 42, the first verse, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee, O Lord. And we're going to look at that today. That was beautiful. Must have been the Spirit uniting us, because I didn't say a word to dear Nancy about that, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you peeked at my notes, no. So there are 12 of these Psalms of the Sons of Korda, beginning with Psalm 42 and 43, which I'll explain in a minute, go together. They're actually one Psalm. So let's turn to that in our Bibles. I'd hope to have it on the screen so we could read it in unison, but we have a little technological problem, which is no big deal. Turn to Psalm 42 in your Bible, <clears throat> and you'll see how it is headed. And this is in the Hebrew authoritative text. It's not just editing or descriptive. It's right in the Masoretic Hebrew text. You'll see that it says it is for the choir director, a maskil for the, from the sons of Korah. A maskil of the sons of Korah. Now, just before we dive into this Psalm 42, 43, let me just say a word about why the Psalms of the Sons of Korah, I think, are especially apropos for our purposes at a place like Chehi. First, these Psalms of the Korahites are certainly some of the most musical in their form. For example, just skip ahead to Psalm 46, another of the Sons of Korah. Go ahead to Psalm 46. And you see how it is headed as well for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamoth, a song. And you see there how it, three stanzas of this psalm are divided by three Selah instructions. At the end of verse 3, though the mountains quake as its swelling pride, Selah. End of verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. And finally, at the very end, verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, repeated, Selah. And all of the evidence now of Hebrew scholarship suggests that these Selah instructions were really none other than musical interludes. A pause. It's been debated, but now the... the evidence is quite clear that they were a pause for spiritual reflection, sometimes stories told of like testimonies almost, but with musical interlude as part of that. Stop, think, reflect, musical interlude, selah. Take time to reflect on what is God saying to you. But secondly, one of the first mentions of these sons of Korah in the whole Bible really, really is important to our understanding why they are significant and comes back in the Old Testament uh, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. So if you'll turn to that, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is one of the first mentionings of this group called the Korahites, or the sons of Korah. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Everybody have that? In our church in Glasgow, Scotland, 
We work with all refugee people. They're all from Muslim backgrounds. And I are constantly saying, put your finger in the text. See it. Read it. Don't trust me. Look at the text. I learned that from a professor at seminary. Always keep your finger in the text, Wesley. Keeps you on track. <laughs> so have your look at it. Don't trust me. See what it says. Chapter 22, Chronicles. Verse 18, 19, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord and the Levites. So these are Levitical people, priests, musical priests, from the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of the Korahites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Now why does the text add that detail about these sons of Korha with a very loud voice? In Hebrew it is Bakal Gadol Le Me Allah. Bakal in a voice. Gadol great or big or loud toward Allah toward that great fervor, or often translated, loud. Why? Why does scripture want us to know that? This phrase, the same very phrase, le bukol gadol le Allah, appears here and there in Hebrew writings to indicate a very important characteristic for every Levitical musician. Passion. In Hebraic culture, it speaks of much more than just loudness. You can get that at any good rock and roll concert. But it bespeaks passion. In the Hebrew culture, very Mideastern, when you wanted to show your passion, you gave it with a loud voice. Not just for theatrics, but because you were so passionate about what you believed. The Muslim people we work with, that's how it is. Boy, it gets so passionate and so loud. Uh, even just in conversation when somebody's making a point. Whereas in some of our Western cultures, we can make the point by doing quite the opposite. Get very quiet. To me, that's even better, but... I'm not a Jew. <laughs> so I want to say to you, wonderful bunch of budding Levitical priests, musicians, if nothing else, let the discipline of music teach you how to express passion. But even more so, let the disciplined study of the scriptures release your passion for God. <clears throat> you are the sons of Korah, the daughters of Korah. You're Levitical musicians, or I hope so, by the end of this week and through the weeks ahead. So now, in just a few minutes we have left, let's take the first of the Psalms of the sons of Korah, Psalm 42. So turn back to that now. And we're going to look a little bit at this psalm to get started and then come back to it in great detail tomorrow. So we'll just get a start on it. Psalm 42. And I would love, and tomorrow we'll get the technology sorted, that we could read it together, but we kind of have to have the same version, don't we? So I'll just read it to you now out of mine. It's the one on the, on the screen tomorrow will be kind of my own translation from Hebrew. Uh, it's, it's better than any that we have, so we'll go with it. <laughs> I think, you know, we'll see. You, you can see if you agree with me or not. Now let me read it out in Psalm 42, 43. Very clearly, we're one psalm originally. They have similar and actually repeated phrases that are... They just are one bit, but they got edited uh, through the Masoretic 
scholars into two. So we're going to put them together. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears, see how honest it is? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go along to the throng and lead the in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember thee from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of thy waterfalls. All thy breakers and thy waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from deceitful and unjust man, for thou art the God of my strength. Why hast thou rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to thy holy hill and to thy dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to the God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise thee, O God, my God. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. I want to suggest that like much of good poetry and musical poetry even more so, there is usually one metaphor that is preeminent and controlling in good poetry. And that's certainly the case in this Psalm 42, 43, and it's quite obviously a metaphor about water, isn't it? We see it first in the opening with the picture of the deer it's actually in Hebrew a, f a doe, a female deer, head dipped down. Doe a deer? <laughs> I could hear it. <laughs> Panting for water, verse 1. And then the semblance to the soul in verse 2 that thirsts for God. Another metaphor of water, thirsting. In verse 3, the beauty of human tears, another expression of water. Have you had experiences such with God that it brings tears? Experiences in the world and pain and struggle that bring tears. Could be honest with God about that. Sophocles had a lot of things wrong, but one of the things he said right is wise men weep easily. And of course, verse 7 is most emphatic with the liturgical resonance of deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. What does that mean? We'll get into that in the next day. 
In the broader corpus of Hebraic poetry, water can be associated realistically, honestly, with chaos and grief and sorrow as well as more happily with refreshment and renewal, of cleaning, of forgiveness, of godly instruction. And even water in the Bible can be a metaphor for community, uh, sharing life together is like water, it's like when you go swimming with your friends. And in fact, much of that we find right here in the space of this one psalm. Clearly, for example, the poetry in this psalm suggests, I propose to you, that we can think of God himself as water. Metaphorically, of course. But again, it suggests the manner in which God might take on the characteristics of water in relation to human beings, in relation to you, in relation to me. Verse 2 gets at this right away with what is minimally an illusion when it speaks of God, but not God alone, but particularly the living God. You see that in verse 2? Let's just read it quickly. <clears throat> My soul thirsts for God, but the poetry isn't satisfied with that, for the living God. It correlates to the Hebraic idea that water is not, is not like other inanimate material, but water is indeed a living commodity. There's all sorts of life in water, isn't there? Alive, the living God. In association then with God in this way is simply a continuation of the critical idea that the God of the Hebrews is not inanimate, is not static, is not totally definable totally explainable, but like poetry, it causes your curiosity. Who is this living God like living water? Very much living. The Hebrew idea of God is very much opposed to an inanimate material staticness, but very much living meaning active and involved in the world of his own creating. And so I have to ask you as we begin these explorations of the ideas of the sons of Korda, is God the living God in your life? Is God active? Do you come to him as involved in your life? active and personal and real and living, not just carved away in some box of doctrine, as important as that is, but animating who you are. The living God is as opposite of inanimate as it can be, so it ought to animate you, especially your music, I would suggest. Now, because of our time, we're going to need to stop there for today. I'm being very well behaved this year and ending even a little early. <laughs> so you can think about this through the day. We'll come back to this, the first Psalm, Psalm 42, 43 of the Sons of Korah tomorrow and look at it in some detail. But that's just to get started today, a little introduction to Psalms, to the Sons of Korah and a brief look into this particular Psalm 42, 43. But you see already how the Levitical singing group, the Levitical musicians, the Levitical priestly 
musicians. Young men and women, I want to inspire you to be Levites, priests, through the powerful medium of musical poetry. Don't ever think of playing music by itself. Think of it as poetry with musical form. I think your teachers would agree that that will really help you shape music, to think of the line like poetry. It's really important how you end the phrase. It's really important that you put the accents where they are because it's poetry, it's not just notes. Be Levites. As this text relates. And I leave you then with this. It is this reality of God, like unto water, that f inspires the passion of these sons of Korah. <coughs> that he is alive and active in our personal lives and in the world around us. If you are a Levitical priest, that thing that marks you as excellence, as a vehicle of passion. Isn't that great? I, I love that. Excellence, so passion for God can come to the world through you. I close with a real personal story. As Graham mentioned, I was here early and got to know Wilmus Chehi really well. He kind of took me under wing and shaped and formed me with his arm around me many times. And on one particular occasion, uh, last year I reminded you how, still to this day, I keep these little cards and whenever I hear something that's important or somebody say something that seems really significant, I write it down. So I have this whole collection of things that Wilmus Chehi shared with me and amongst others. And he had invited me back in Muncie, there was always evening uh, worship services, kind of revivals uh, that there'd be like four or five people come to. <laughs> and Wilmus and Gladys would be the musicians and so he, they would get tired of that all summer. So they invited some of us to come and perform to help them out. So he'd asked me to come sing for this group. And actually it was a good sized group that night, 50 or 60. And I remember Wilma saying to me just before the service began, it was quite memorable. He said, sing with passion, Wes, because you're actually singing before God. Passion. Let your discipline in music today bring out your passion, both for music, but in the context of how scripture can release your passion for God. Lord Jesus, go with us throughout this day. Thank you for these dear students and the teachers and this incredible work of Chehi Summer School of Music. I pray you'd really give them vigor today and help them conceive of themselves as excellent Levitical musician priests, learning to craft well so that passion that comes from God, holy, godly passion, would mark all that they do and we do together in the name of Jesus. Amen.